Today, I'd like to talk about John Williams, my favorite composer. Now, I wanted to do a list of all of my favorite composers and put them in order, but honestly, John Williams would have been 1 through 15, so I'm just going to focus on him. I'm Fox Sellers, and if you like these type of videos, please click like and subscribe, and you'll be keyed into future videos. Thanks. With John Williams' portfolio, he has about 116 if you count the upcoming Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which naturally I couldn't include in this list. So these are going to be my top 40 John Williams composed films. I want to start off with an honorable mention, which is going to be Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler on the Roof would have been somewhere pretty high on the list. However, he didn't write it. He rearranged a play. Uh, that that included a lot of little things that he did. If you watch the film Fiddler on the Roof, there's there's moments in it that is like, oh, that's just completely John Williams' music. However, the meat and the bones of it is not his, so I didn't want to include it. But I wanted to have an honorable mention, so that's at 41. So now, let's get started with the actual list. Number 40, Tom Sawyer. Number 39, Iger Sanction. Number 38, Presumed Innocent. Number 37, Valley of the Dolls. Valley of the Dolls sounds like a typical score that you would hear from the 60s, but honestly, to be fair, it's it's got a very active melody to it constantly throughout compared to its contemporaries at the time. Number 36, Space Camp. Number 35, The Book Thief. Number 34, Lincoln. Number 33, Dracula. Number 32, The Witches of Eastwick. Williams adds to witches the sexy mystique with this like small town Rockwell everyday suburban life. At the same time, he, he's threading an undertone of this like mysterious legend, this forbidden fruit. And I, and I really like that. This, this movie does kind of stand out in compared to others. Number 31, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The melody that you hear throughout Close Encounters of the Third Kind, it, it's, it's, it's very like familiar. It, 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 it's these few little notes that are familiar yet mathematical, and it's exactly what you'd expect scientists to use anytime that they first wanted to communicate with extraterrestrials. Number 30, Hook. Hook has a lot of these like childlike themes. At the same time too, they're like, they're, there's moments that are scary, there's moments that are filled with fun, filled with wonder, and he captures that essence. And I really love that about the, the theme music and all the little things that you hear in Hook. Number 29, Towering Inferno. Number 28, The Accidental Tourist. Number 27, Seven Years in Tibet. John does this sad, longing undertone throughout seven years in Tibet and you literally feel like you just like the character Brad Brad Pitt's character in this where you, you you're just you're removed from your life for a, I mean I sometimes joke that the movie is seven years in Tibet because it's kind of long and dragging but it really has this longing to it and John Williams captured that essence number 26 home alone number 25 minority report Number 24, Empire of the Sun. Number 23, The Cowboys. The Cowboys, honestly, it's, it's the first John Williams score that sounds like a John Williams score.
Now, by 1972, nobody knew what a John Williams score was. But this one, it does borrow a bit from its predecessors in respect to the, the, you know, the size and the landscape of Western type films. Very, very, very reminiscent of Magnificent Seven. It's got a lot of strings, it's fast paced, it moves, and it's very, very playful. Much of like what we've now come used to with John Williams scores. Number 22, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Number 21, The Force Awakens. Number 20, AI, Artificial Intelligence. Number 19, Return of the Jedi. Number 18, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Number 17, Schindler's List. Number 16, Jurassic Park. Number 15, Sleepers. Now, this is one that's this is one of his darker scores. And if you've seen the movie, you do find this very appropriate. This is a very, very dark movie. And and bless him, because he really brings musically, he brings us down into the deep confines of our subconscious in, in a in a horrific way, a very horrific way. And his music encapsulates that. Number 14, Saving Private Ryan. Number 13, The Phantom Menace. Number 12, Jaws 2, which in in my heart, it's as good as Jaws 1. However, Jaws 1 came before it and Jaws 1 did some things that Jaws 2 couldn't have done had Jaws 1 not come before it. So I, I do put Jaws 2 at number 12. It does a lot of playful, happy little things um, in its fanfare. Number 11, The Patriot. Number 10, Catch Me If You Can. Catch Me If You Can has this nifty little jazz motif that uh, works really, really well. And you swear to God, you're watching a 60s movie because most, most of the story takes place in the 60s. And he finds a way to include like a, a theme, a period theme that's, that's, that's a lot like Hitchcock theme movies. It, it's a lot like James Bond movies. It's a lot like the Pink Panther. It's very, very catchy. I love it. Number nine, Amistad. When John Williams gets to play with a chorus, much like I, I had Phantom Menace earlier on this list, or uh, even Empire of the Sun, he gets to show off his b- ability to create these fantastic melodies. However, he's using a living instrument, the voice. It's powerful, touching, and worldly. And John Williams is the only one that can do it on that level. Number eight, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Number seven, Memoirs of a Geisha. With Memoirs of a Geisha, I can sit and play this soundtrack all the way through and I'm completely swept away. The violins of it, they they pull you in in a way that's very introspective and almost insulating you from the rest of the world, which is very much what the character in this film is doing. She's removed from everybody because she's in such a dark place. She doesn't really allow herself to be in touch with her surroundings. Number six, Star Wars. John Williams, he actually steals a lot from from his uh, from his predecessors, which it was just totally natural. I mean, that's how art works, uh, especially music, but. He, he steals a couple of interesting things that work so great. And this is what makes Star Wars what it is. And so the themes in this, he, he, the main theme he actually gets from King's Row, which is an Eric Korngold uh, composed film. Uh, that and he also, the, the characters throughout, I mean, naturally, most people will notice Peter and the Wolf. It, the, he does kind of take that, that approach to that. But he also takes from Holtz's Planets uh, Symphony, which if you've heard it, you'll you'll be like, oh, that's very reminiscent of Star Wars. Well, this came first. Number five, Jaws. 
it's pretty awesome and it shows it shows how he understood the most simple academic approach to creating tension and terror the brilliance of the two notes that are spoken of for this film uh, he uses it it's very reminiscent of Dvorak's fourth movement from his 19th symphony, you know, as, in, as, in, as inspiration for this. Uh, the tension builds and this it, it has a primal feeling that's created by alternating the semitone motif. Now, not, not only is this a, a, a tense score, but it, it, it's, it's filled with like a cavalcade of fun melodies that are associated with sailing and celebration for the 4th of July and adventure. Number four, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I wanted to have Temple of Doom ahead of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Temple of Doom much more impresses me as a musical score than Raiders, even though Raiders is absolutely amazing. But Temple of Doom takes that amazing and brings it and puts it way up here with a lot of completely different things. It also has very traditional cliche musical motifs from, you know, that, that relate to India and China and applies to some of the greatest composers of all times. There's a little bit of Tchaikovsky, there's a little bit of Dvorak, there's a little bit of Korngold. Uh, and because Indiana is this pulp character that Williams is able to play with these themes with, um, he, he can do it in, in, in a way that's tongue in cheek. So you get a little bit of Wiley e. Coyote and Cat and Mouse to the, this musical score. And because he's schooled in like the highest caliber of classical academia, the music doesn't come off as cartoonish. It's rich, it's cultured, it's melodically gorgeous. Number three, E.T., the extraterrestrial. E.T.'s main theme is played with a piccolo, and it gives this feeling of gentleness towards life. It's done in a Lydian mode that's raised to the fourth scale, which adds this mystery to the character. Um, anytime he's present. The bicycle theme, it's lively and, and rhythmic and builds to a climax. And the children that are chased at this point, you know, they, they take the existing themes for the children, but it adds energy and this syncopated rhythm, and it makes the notes more prominent to demonstrate the danger of the chase that they're in. And, and by the end, when, when E.T. is saying goodbye, Williams adds this beautiful, larger-than-life theme. But it's just a combination of the flying theme and the highlights from the bicycle chase. And it ends in this crescendo that is so emotional. I, I can't help, I, you know, and I have to confess, I, I cry a little bit, at the very least, a little bit, every single time I get to the end of E.T. Number two, The Empire Strikes Back. This is my favorite film of all times. Now, it has really big string sounds to it. It's always moving, um, but it's, it's moodier than the first one it's because it's a much darker movie. So because it's a much darker movie, it, it has a lowered register on most of the instruments uh, compared to Star Wars, of course. I mean, and... and this movie is much more visual than the original Star Wars, which I, I know is a, you know, a tall order, but, but it is. So Williams was actually able to play a lot more with this musically. Everyone knows the theme to Star Wars. Uh, it, it, it's this iconic theme. However, even more iconic than this is the Imperial March, that, that theme that goes along with Darth Vader. And not everybody realizes it, but it didn't show up until the Empire Strikes Back. So he took one of the greatest scores ever, and then he added it and added more iconic scores. And when I say more, I mean, I mean they were more iconic than the original Star Wars ones. So can you imagine like they're not being the Imperial March? You 
also have all these other new themes too that he introduced, like the asteroid, the the you know the the melody from the asteroid field, which is synonymous now with the Millennium Falcon. You have Yoda's theme, which is very reminiscent of the uh, the the Force theme. And then he also takes Leia's theme and then he improves upon it by having it be a love theme between Leia and Han. Empire, in essence, it's a, it's a Greek tragedy. Um, so Williams takes full advantage of that. And, and naturally, like any type of tragedy is much more emotionally jerking to your soul than you know your typical story so he's able to take advantage of that and when you have the last third section of the film it really because it's a tragedy things are really going downhill you know when they get to Bespin so you have the Bespin theme you have the dramatic battle between Luke and Vader and then you also have when Han is frozen in carbonite and and in this dramatic ending you know painful and scary they're, they're all just barely escaping by the end and John Williams is the only person that could have composed and and you know do, done a musical narration of this Greek tragedy and finally number one Superman this is the greatest score in my eyes and it's at the peak of John Williams' career. I mean, this is a time when he had just done, he'd recently done Star Wars. Uh, he had done Jaws before that. Empire Strikes Back was coming after this. Raiders of the Lost Ark was coming. I mean, within that four period, four year period of time, he's pumping out the greatest scores of all times. Superman is right in the middle of it, and it shows you his full ability. This is the ultimate crescendo. Almost Every part of the score escalates, especially the main fanfare motif. Now, the score, a lot of people say it's broken into three motifs. You've got the the march, the fanfare, and then the love theme. Um, But within each one of those, those are broken up into three parts as well. Um, So the movie itself, you've got Krypton, you've got Smallville, and you've got Metropolis. And within each one of those, I mean, like I said, this is the ultimate crescendo. Each one of those escalates. So, and if if you listen to the music by the end of those three acts, it is at the height. Like even like even the Smallville part, which is a lot more subtle. It's very Roman. Uh, it's very Norman Rockwell esque. So it, it you know it doesn't have that much to crescendo. But if you Listen to the music just at the end. And Richard Donner does this great, uh, you know, dolly cam that, that you know, rises up and goes with the music. And I don't know. I, I'm assuming John Williams kind of, you know, the, the, the movie was already filmed and he was just doing that and rising with it. That that alone would have been the most magnificent thing in most films. And that's probably the least of the three acts. Let's not also forget the very simple fact of the main theme of the march that leads up. And it literally says the words, Superman. Excuse me. Simple, but absolutely brilliant. When I was a kid and this movie came on TV... Even just watching the opening credits was the most exciting thing because the music was just so good leading up to that. And it does this thing where it's like, it just, it builds and it builds and it builds. And when it gets to its like climax, It's building and building and it just explodes into like almost like a a ta-da. And and surprisingly, Superman 2, which he didn't do, 
but they had so many little, little musical things that they just took it and rearranged it. And if you watch Superman 2, you're like, wow, the music in this is just fantastic. And it sounds very different. It's not. They just moved things around and they took the themes and, you know, there's a different composer. So he, he used it in his way, but it's the same score. The, the notes aren't any different whatsoever. And if you want to celebrate heroism, this is the most obvious choice. Thanks for listening all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed my list. If you have any comments or you have opinions about the list, please comment below. Go ahead, click like and subscribe, and you'll be keyed in on future videos that I do. Thanks for joining me.